Welcome to Echoing Faith Today, a podcast conversation on themes of impact and relevance in the Directory for Catechesis, published by the Vatican Dicastery for Evangelization. I'm Dr. Jem Sullivan, host and faculty in the School of Theology and Religious Studies at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. On this podcast, we hear from theologians and scholars, as well as those serving on the front lines of pastoral ministry. So welcome and thank you for taking your place at this table of conversation. The Directory for Catechesis describes seven sources of catechesis in the new evangelization. And one of those sources is theology. As the church prepares to celebrate a jubilee year in 2025, Pope Francis has invited the faithful to return to the four constitutions of the Second Vatican Council the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, and the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. To help us explore key theological themes in these four constitutions of Vatican II, I'm delighted to welcome back to the podcast Monsignor Paul McPartland, renowned theologian and the Col J. Peter Professor of Systematic Theology and Ecumenism at the Catholic University of America. Monsignor McPartland is a priest of the Archdiocese of Westminster in the UK and has served for two terms on the International Theological Commission. Since 2005, Monsignor McPartland has served as a member of the International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church and has participated in the International Anglican Roman Catholic and Roman Catholic Methodist Dialogues. Monsignor McPartland, thank you so much for taking the time to guide us through key theological themes in the four constitutions of the Second Vatican Council. Welcome back to the podcast. It's great to be with you again. Thank you. So we began this series on key teachings of Vatican II with the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Today, we turn to Lumen Gentium, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, the second of the constitutions promulgated at Vatican II. In our first conversation, you had noted the importance of reading and interpreting the four constitutions as a unity in a hermeneutic of reform in continuity, I think is what you had mentioned. So please share with our audience uh, the connections to be made between the Council's reflections on liturgy and the nature, structure, and mission of the church. Thank you, yes. the the um, We discussed last time the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, which, as we were saying, is the, the first document that Vatican II promulgated. And in fact, the quite remarkable thing is how much teaching on the church there was in that document on the liturgy. And, uh, you know, we might remind ourselves of some of those points. The document on the liturgy says that it's actually in the liturgy that we experience the true nature of the church. And that makes us think that, yes, the church is especially a liturgical community. The most fundamental thing we do as members of the church is to praise God. And so it also says that the liturgy is actually the source and the summit of the life of the church. And that makes you think again of, you know, source and summit. That's two movements. The source, the life of the church flows out from the liturgy. But the liturgy is also the summit. The life of the church flows into the liturgy. So it's almost as if the liturgy is where we gather as the church and then are sent out as the church to do our churchly work in the world. I often like to use the image of the liturgy and especially the Eucharist as a kind of heartbeat of the church because we gather it's the summit of our lives and then we go out again sent out into the world it's the source of our lives and our activity so you know a liturgical understanding of the church it said also and we're still looking at this (laughs) the, the constitution on the sacred liturgy it says that the liturgy is actually where we experience being the body of christ 
because we are joined to our head, who is Christ, and he gives us the immense privilege of sharing in his prayer and praise of his Father. And that's what liturgy actually is. It is being joined as members of the body of Christ with the worship of Christ himself and with his great sacrifice of himself to his Father. So being the body of Christ. It also says that we should all actively participate in the liturgy because the church is a priestly people, a royal priesthood. So the idea of being the people of God as well and a priestly people. It said also that the principal manifestation of the church is when all the faithful in a local church, in a diocese, gather with their bishop around one altar for the celebration of the Eucharist with his priests and the deacons there as well. And that makes us think of the bishop as the prime liturgical presider, not just a kind of administrative figure. So we're, we're being introduced into a different way of thinking of the church in the document on the liturgy. And then perhaps just, just finally, it says that in the earthly liturgy, we take part in a foretaste of the heavenly liturgy, which is celebrated in the holy Jerusalem, to which we are, where, where all the saints are gathered. So you have that wonderful idea of the church as a communion, that the church on earth united with the church in heaven, and of course the souls in purgatory, one great family, one great communion. So if you like, you know, these are points about the church that are already made in the document on the liturgy. And so I, I, I often think that really Lumen Gentium, which is the dogmatic constitution on the church, is the place where all of these points that are already made in the document on the liturgy are worked out, if you like, doctrinally in all their detail. Almost, you could say, that Lumen Gentium is a dogmatic commentary on Sacrosanctum Concilium, perhaps we could say. Lumen Gentium in many ways is the engine room of the council. It's where, you know, the council really works out in very important understandings of what the church is, what the church is about, what is the membership of the church, the relationship and the roles of all the different members. So there's an, an immense amount going on in Lumen Gentium, but it's very important to keep a, an overall perspective. And so I suppose we could say, you know, um, what do we learn from, from uh, basically from uh, this presentation of the church at the council? Well, for many, centuries really most of the second millennium that the catholic church had understood itself in a rather juridical and institutional way as a pyramid uh, with the pope at the top and then the bishops and then the priests and then the people at the bottom of the pyramid and that gives you a very administrative governing kind of impression of the bishops and of the pope himself and, of course, the danger is that you have a rather passive understanding of the people at the bottom of the pyramid. And, you know, from the ideas I've just been mentioning, the points from Sacrosanctum Concilium um, that are then elaborated and worked out in Lumen Gentium, we see really a very different understanding of the church being put in place not primarily an institution, not primarily a juridical pyramid, but think more biblically and in terms that the fathers of the church used, patristically and liturgically. The church is the people of God. The church is the body of Christ. The church is a communion of life, sharing the life, participating in the life of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. A communion, a communion. And so, you know, in the church as a communion, nobody is passive, nobody's at the bottom of a pyramid, everyone is active, everyone is involved in the church's worship, everyone is involved in the church's mission. The Eucharist, again, as the source and summit of the life of the church, that, that same statement is made in Lumen Gentium. And Therefore, you know, if you think of the Eucharist as really the heartbeat of the church, 
where does the Eucharist take place? In local churches. So once again, we're not so much thinking of one monolithic pyramid, we're thinking of a communion of local churches, deeply bound to one another by the mystery of the Eucharist that we all share. And the bishops are at the heart of those local communities, primarily preaching the word. That's their first task, says Lumen Gentium, and presiding at the liturgy. And of course, governing, but you know, governing is not the first and foremost thing. They are the church's prime evangelists, the church's high priests, and the church's primary shepherds. So, you know, that's a package that belongs together. And as a communion of life in the church with everybody involved, all the members of the church are called to holiness. This is one of the really big themes in Lumen Gentium. You know, again, nobody's passive. Nobody's just along for the ride, if you like. Everybody's active. Everybody's called to holiness. The church is the, the, the family of life in which we should all find our fulfillment and be a sign of, you know, the fulfillment that the whole world can find by knowing and loving Jesus. And really, you know, just to just to uh, conclude that point, no previous council had ever spoken of the church so extensively and um, in fact you know the 20th century was dubbed very early on as being the century of the church it was sensed that you know the 20th century was going to see a great deal of a deepening of reflection on the church what is the church the mystery of the church's life and you know it's no coincidence that right at the heart of that century of the church comes this great document from Vatican II on the church in, in 1964. And it's perhaps worth saying that, you know, there was a lot of unfinished business as well from the first Vatican Council, because the first Vatican Council wanted to, to, uh, to give a, a, a very extensive teaching on the church. And there was a draft document of 15 chapters the first of which was about the church as the body of Christ. But Vatican I took place in very uh, delicate political circumstances and knew that it might not get through all of its business. And so this very rich document on the church was radically pruned from 15 chapters down to four, just focusing on really the papacy the Pope's primacy, the Pope's infallibility, and they wanted to get that document through at least. And then having done that, the council was adjourned because the Franco-Prussian War broke out and all sorts of consequences followed. So you can imagine how much was left on the cutting room floor, so to speak, after the first Vatican Council. And of course, there's so much more to say about the church than just what Vatican I said, very importantly, about the Pope. Yes, that's important, but it's not the whole story. So there was a great deal more that needed to be said when the Church returned to reflection upon this great mystery. Who are we as the Church? And that's really what Vatican II was able to accomplish, benefiting, it has to be said, from a lot of renewal in the Church in the early 20th century renewal of biblical studies and patristic studies and liturgical studies. So in fact, it was quite providential in a way that the full discussion on the church actually was delayed a bit until the 1960s. Thank you, Monsignor, for really um, showing us, first of all, this vital connection between liturgy and church. Uh, as you've shown us so well in, in all of the themes that really are in uh, the Constitution on the Liturgy, but now will be further fleshed out in this document on the Church. I'm very struck also by uh, your description of how these very ancient, in fact, uh, images or biblical images um, uh, of, for the Church are now being restored in our imagination, in our thinking, and our experience of the Church, the people of God, the body of Christ, a communion ecclesiology, uh, all of those helping us to see this in a really new way. And so thank you for drawing our attention to that, but also keeping in mind the unity of these documents, I think is very important as we continue our conversations about them. Um, 
I was just wondering if you could then from those, you've already mentioned uh, quite a number of them, uh, but what key theological principles in Lumen Gentium would you highlight for further study as in for anyone returning to the teachings of this document of Vatican II? Well, I think that, you know, the, the, the story of the document itself is quite instructive because one of the points we, we noted last time was that the constitution on the liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, was very quickly approved and ratified by the council because the draft was in a very good state at the start of the council for the reasons that we were discussing last time. The, the, the same was not true of the draft document on the church um, because uh, when this was um, first presented at the council in the fall of 1962, the bishops were really very critical of it. You know, it, uh, I mentioned before, that idea that had been in place for a very long time of the church as a, as a juridical pyramid, if you like. And that was really the dominant idea in the opening draft at Vatican II. And the bishops really felt that that was, that was not adequate. Uh, you know, it wasn't sufficiently in tune with all the reflection that had gone on on the church in the early 20th century. Um, it, was, it was still far too juridical. Uh, the first chapter of that draft was on the nature of the church militant, so it was, it was just really focused on the church on earth and in that, uh, in its institutional reality. And the first draft was very resoundingly uh, criticized for being too institutional, too juridical, too triumphalist, actually, interestingly, uh, too clerical, and really just old fashioned, old fashioned. We could do better than this. And so, in fact, the, the document went through several drafts. It was really the fourth draft that was finally approved by the council two years later in 1964. So, you know, a great deal of redrafting and rethinking had gone on in the meantime. And without going into too much of the fine detail of the, of the different drafts, just to draw out, you know, what, because you're asking about the, the theological principles, I think we can, we can highlight some very particular things that came out during the process of redrafting. First of all, the first chapter was radically changed. Now, not to be, you know, the nature of the church militant, the first chapter now was the mystery of the church. And that is just, you know, a word which opens perspectives, because mystery, of course, makes you think, first of all, of the life of God himself. And the mystery of the church makes us realize that, you know, the church is part of God's purpose in the world of, well, what is God's purpose? St. John's Gospel says Jesus came to gather together the scattered children of God. So, you know, the work of God is to gather us together. And I often think, you know, we might say that sin separates us and drives us apart. Grace gathers us and draws us together. So this is God's purpose in the world. So the church has mystery, makes us realize that the church is privileged to participate in the life of God and is and in the world at the service of the great mystery of salvation that God wants to bring to the world. So the church's mystery really changes our perspectives radically. And then also um, there was a decision to switch the order of the chapters on the people of God and the hierarchy. The, initially, the hierarchy was put before the people of God in a rather, can we say, trickle-down way, a sort of pyramid way. And the, the decision was made to reverse the order of those chapters. First and foremost, all of the baptized belong to the people of God. And the members of the hierarchy are those who are called out from among their brothers and sisters to a ministry of service. So in a sense, by flipping the order there, we turn the pyramid upside down. And in fact, you know, in 2015, Pope Francis gave a very important address on the church, 
on the anniversary of the Synod of Bishops in, in 2015, at the 50th anniversary. And he himself said that, you know, the best way to understand the church really is as an inverted pyramid, because the ministers of the church properly understood are at the service of their brothers and sisters. And as we know, one of the most ancient titles for the Pope is the servant of the servants of God. So if you like, at the bottom of an inverted pyramid, <laughs> rather than at the top of an upright pyramid. So, you know, these were very important steps to, to bring in this idea of mystery, to bring in this idea of ministry in the church at the service of our brothers and sisters, the people of God. The drafting also decided to uh, have a chapter on Mary in this document on the church, because there was uh, quite a body of opinion that Mary should have a document of her own. And a decisive vote was taken, which actually was just was very narrowly uh, won by those who said, no, Mary really should go into the document on the church because she is the greatest example of a disciple of Christ. She is, you might almost say, you know, if the church is the bride of Christ, she's almost the very personification of the bride of Christ. She is the first and foremost disciple. She is the first and foremost member of the church, benefiting from the grace of her beloved son. So have Mary in this document as a sign to us all of the holiness to which we're all called, and, you know, so that idea of holiness, as I said, the universal call to holiness, and also, interestingly, a chapter in, uh, was inserted into this document on religious in the church. You know, it's, it's perhaps easy to think that, oh no, it's religious, those who are called, you know, sisters and brothers, they're the people called to holiness. Well, no, we're all called to holiness. And just as the chapter on the hierarchy was put after the chapter on the people of God to show that really the ministers of the church are at the service of their brothers and sisters, so the chapter on religious in the church was put immediately after the chapter on the universal call to holiness, which teaches us, I think, that the role of religious in the church is in fact to promote the holiness of the whole church the holiness of all their brothers and sisters. That is their own particular service and contribution. So, you know, during the drafting process, these key principles um, came to the fore and found expression. And I suppose I would sort of um, highlight perhaps, you know, first and foremost, that idea of the church as mystery. This means, as the, the document says, that no one image suffices. If we're here dealing with God's great purpose of salvation, there are going to be many images, people of God, body of Christ, the vine and the branches, the temple of the spirit, the, the, the holy building uh, that God is, is, is building with living stones. All of these biblical images, the church as mystery means we need many images. The church is at the service of God in the world. And then the church as communion, this fact that, you know, the body of Christ, the people of God, what's the internal bond that unites all the members of the body, all the people? It's the bond of communion. So the church as communion. There isn't a chapter in Lumen Gentium on the church as communion. But if you look very closely, you see that this word is all over the document. We keep finding it. And for instance, you know, in, um, in Lumen Gentium 4, it actually says that the church is a people brought into unity from the unity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lumen Gentium 9 on the people of God tells us that the church is a communion of life and love and truth. So this word communion, you know, when we come and receive the Eucharist, we're taken up into communion with Jesus and communion with one another. The more you look at Lumen Gentium, this word communion is in many, many places. It is, it, there are lots and lots of occurrences. And in fact, 20 years after Vatican II in 1985, 
when there was a special assembly of the Synod of Bishops to commemorate 20 years on from the Council, they actually said that communion is the central and fundamental idea of the Council's documents. That's a very big statement to make. So the church has mystery, the church has communion. And then I would also highlight the idea of the church as sacrament. You know, the church has got a visible structure in the world. Yes, of course it has. But the, that through that visible structure, God himself wants to communicate grace and goodness to the world. So the church has an outer form and an inner life, the outer sign of inward grace. That's the classic definition in Catholic teaching of a sacrament. And the idea that you could think of the whole church as a big sacrament in the world is one of the leading ideas, not just of Lumen Gentium, but it ripples across all of the documents. You know, it's worth remembering that the opening words of this document are Lumen Gentium cum sit Christus, since Christ is the light of the world, the church's task is to transmit that light into the world. So once again, you've got the idea that, yes, the church has a presence here on earth, but through which the light of Christ is meant to be shining, through which God's grace of communion is meant to be operative, shining a light so as to call the world to the light of Christ, call the world to the communion sharing in God's life. And so we can put these together, in fact, and say that the church in the world is a great sacrament of communion. And when we say that, we really are very much at the heart of Vatican II's understanding of the church, a great sacrament of communion, a sign in the world of God's grace, God's goodness, the light of Christ, which calls us from the division that so afflicts the world into a union which only God can give, communion, a sharing in his life. And, Vat and Lumen Gentium actually says that, you know, each of the individual sacraments, which of course, you know, we're not saying we're, we're, we're changing that doctrine at all. Of course, there are seven sacraments, but it puts each of them within the context of the church as the great sacrament. So each of the sacraments which benefit members of the church benefit them precisely so that they can play their role in the church. And no sacrament is just purely a gift to an individual, period. No, every sacrament is a grace and a gift to individuals in the church to strengthen their life and their contribution to the church as a whole, because the church is a great sacrament. And, you know, in, in uh, just after the millennium in 2001, Pope John Paul produced a most wonderful document called Novo Millennio Ineunte, as we start the new millennium. And he said that to, to make the church the home and the school of communion is the great challenge facing us as we begin this new millennium, he said. And he actually said, that's the challenge that we have to meet if we want to be faithful to God's plan and to respond to the world's deepest yearnings. And there, I think he really makes us realize that, you know, the whole world, the whole of humanity made in the image of God, we're made for communion, but we are afflicted by so much division and hostility and uh, rivalry and indeed, you know, conflict. But God calls us to communion, and we have to learn that life of communion in the church, the church as home and school of communion, so that we can be a sacrament of communion in the world, bringing the world light and goodness and good news. Thank you, Monsignor, for just really just an excellent description of these key principles of Lumen Gentium, theological principles, um, that help us, I mean, as I, I hear you speak, I, I, I cannot but help 
think that we, we should not underestimate how significant these themes truly are uh, in terms of not only their newness at the council, but also how they can in fact radically uh, change the way we experience the life of the church today. Uh, that this council was really about a truly a renewal of our understanding of what it means to be a member of the church um, and to participate in this great mystery. I'm, I'm struck by that, that, that fundamental theme you talked about in terms of church's mystery and how this mystery is really a reflection. It's mystery because it is a participation in the very life of God. The Trinitarian mystery is at really the heart of the mystery of the church. Um, and Christ, of course, as the light of the nation, light to the nation. So thank you for these really excellent uh, reminders of the things that we should be focusing on as we look at this document uh, in these rich themes. You know, as we mentioned at the start of this series, uh, Pope Francis invited the faithful to return to the four constitutions of Vatican II in preparation for the Jubilee 2025. Uh, you know, I recall Pope Benedict XVI once saying in an interview some time ago, uh, that any crisis in the church is at root a crisis in understanding the nature and the mission of the church. And so just if you could comment on why is it important to read carefully and interpret well this particular constitution, Lumen Gentium, as you've outlined for us so so well. Well, I think it's it's important to read this document so as to to have, if you like, the right basic perspectives of on the church, to understand what the church is basically about in the world. And, you know, to have that understanding of the church as mystery, the church as sacrament, offering something precious to the world, which, of course, makes us realize that the church has a mission in the world. Very interestingly, um, you know, the the uh, one of the the very influential bishops at the council, um, Cardinal Suenens from Belgium, he uh, at one stage and in, in still in the planning stage for the council said that really, and I think I, I may have mentioned this in our in our first uh, discussion, that um, he said, you know, the council really should be a great period of reflection by the church on the final instruction that Jesus gave, go out to the whole world, proclaim the good news. The council, council should really be an occasion when we take stock. How well are we doing in meeting that challenge? That's what the Lord asked us to do. How effective are we being? And so, you know, the church as mystery, the church as sacrament, where the church exists in the world for the salvation of the world. You know, if the church is a communion, we're offering the world this communion. We're not meant to be keeping it to ourselves. We're precisely meant to be offering the world something precious that the world longs for. You know, Jesus said at the Last Supper, my own peace I give you, a peace the world cannot give. So many people in the world want peace want communion, want to have good relations, productive interaction and working with other people, not just constant rivalry and conflict. And the church is privileged to, 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 to know the key to that peace, that communion. And this is something that we're absolutely not meant to keep to ourselves. So precisely as a sacrament of communion, the church, of course, is meant to be looking outwards to the world. I mean, a sacrament, an outward sign is a sign. Well, to who? A sign to the world. And that, that very concept makes us realize the church is meant to be on mission in the world. And, you know, Pope Francis uh, often makes this point that the church should be turned outwards, not turned inwards. You know, he says the church should absolutely not be self-referential. I mean, this is this is just, you know, the, the very worst possible thing for, for the church to engage in, kind of being self-referential. We're meant to be looking out to the world and keen for mission and doing the Lord's work in the world. You know, if the church is the body of Christ, that means that the church is really the means by which Jesus himself works in the world of today, still bringing good news, still bringing grace and peace and forgiveness and salvation, still giving hope to the world. So many people want hope. And, you know, the church is the bearer of these precious gifts of Christ himself 
his instrument, his members. This is what being the body of Christ means. You know, it's not just uh, a, a, a privilege that we, we enjoy for ourselves. It is, of course, an immense privilege, but it's a privilege that comes with a commissioning as members of the body of Christ. We're meant to be at the service of Christ in the world. And, you know, one of the most remarkable teachings of Lumen Gentium is how it makes plain that the people of God, all of the baptized, are on mission in the world meant to be sanctifying the world. You know, this is the church's mission to bring holiness and goodness into the world, to bring communion and light, the light of Christ, into the world. And everyone has a role to play. And so when Lumen Gentium talks about the universal call to holiness, yes, all the members of the church are called to holiness, but they're also called to be working for the sanctification of the world at large. So they're called to holiness themselves and called to work for holiness in the world, sanctifying the world itself because it's God's world. He made it. He loves it. And so, you know, he wants the whole world to find its fulfillment. And we are privileged to know that its fulfillment lies in Jesus. And the whole world has a right to hear that good news. You remember, uh, St. Paul once said, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And it's very interesting. He, it was an examination of conscience, you know. Woe to me if I am so blasé, if you like, about the, the great privilege that I have to know Jesus, that I just want to keep it to myself and don't want to share it. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And so, you know, these are the, the important perspectives, the fundamental perspectives that we need regularly just to renew in our hearts and our minds from this document. And also to realize, you know, that Lumen Gentium has a great richness. Lumen Gentium has a great balance in its teaching. And so many delicate issues are very carefully explained. For instance, the relationship between the Pope and the bishops. This had been, uh, you know, a matter of some controversy over centuries in, in the church. But, you know, Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, talks about the collegiality of the bishops, whereby together with the Pope and never apart from him, they have supreme and full authority in the church, making us think of the 12 apostles. Peter was one of the apostles and the head of the apostles. So, you know, the bishops all around the world are in the most profound union with one another and with the Pope himself. And that union is what the council taught about when it spoke of the collegiality of the bishops. And of course, you know, that again is a mystery of communion. The communion of the bishops with one another and with the Pope himself is, the, is a, a sign, you might say, of communion, uh, the communion life of the church as a whole. There is communion amongst its shepherds. The collegiality of the bishops is what we call it. And then, you know, Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, works out the right relationship between the clergy and the laity. You know, not clericalism, not a pyramid with clergy on a privileged role on pedestals, but, you know, clergy in service to the laity, because all of us are baptized disciples, first of all. So no clericalism, a proper understanding that the, the ministers of the church are in service of their brothers and sisters. The document also talks about the balance between the Catholic Church and other churches, you might say. You know, how are we to think of this? Well, the document says very clearly that the church that Christ founded subsists in the Catholic Church. So that church that Christ founded is still to be found today in the Catholic Church. Where will we find it? Well, we will find it where the successor of the, the Pope, the, sorry, the successor of Peter, and the successors of the apostles that Jesus first entrusted the church to are to be found today. That's with the bishops in union with the Pope. So, you know, yes, the fullness of the church is to be found in the Catholic Church. But does that mean that we, we you know, don't appreciate any, any gifts elsewhere? 
It certainly does not mean that. The council said that there are many elements of the church, all sorts of, if you like, the, the component parts of the church, the ingredients of the church, that we will also find outside the visible bounds of the Catholic Church. We will find a great spirit of prayer, a great devotion to the scriptures, a great love of God, um, a, a devotion to Our Lady. And at least some of the sacraments, baptism, celebrated across the Christian family. So it teaches us to appreciate these gifts, these elements of the church that are found in varying measures in other Christian communities. And so, yes, the fullness of the, of the gifts of salvation are to be found in the Catholic Church. But let us appreciate that very many uh, elements of the church that exist outside and that of course is the basis for ecumenism because we want to share as many as possible of these gifts because all of these gifts belong together and so working for ecumenism is working really for a maximal sharing of the gifts that God has given to his church and Pope John Paul himself in his great encyclical on ecumenism Utunum Sint gave that very perspective, that ecumenism is, is aimed towards a maximal sharing of all of the gifts that God has given to his church. And very interestingly, the decree on ecumenism from Vatican II came out on the same day as Lumen Gentium, and Pope Paul VI said these two documents should be read together. And perhaps just a, a final point there again, you know, the, the church is holy. The church is the body of Christ. Yes. And so we must never uh, lose that perspective. But we must also be realistic and realize that, you know, as the people of God, we are still sinners on our way to the fullness of holiness, on our way to what St. Paul calls, you know, when the body of Christ achieves its full stature. So let us have no illusions that, you know, the church can do no wrong. We're all too painfully aware in recent times of the faults and failings and the scandals and the abuse that, that, that are so scandalous and uh, so, so harmful to the work and the, the witness of the church. Lumen Gentium says the church is holy, but always in need of penance and renewal. And the document on uh, ecumenism likewise says the church is called to continual reform, continual reformation, it actually says. So, yes, the church is holy, undoubtedly, but always in need of greater holiness. So, you know, getting the right balance there, too. So I think those are just some of the examples of the way there's there's a great balance in the rich, rich teaching of Lumen Gentium. Thank you, Monsignor. And I'm so struck by, you know, your reminder, helpful reminder, that we need to have the right perspectives on these themes, that it's not enough to just read the documents, but to really see them in light of all of the, the kind of the rich mosaic that it really is of themes about the church, and each one really kind of shedding light on the other. I'm also really struck by your opening comment uh, with the drawing attention to the, the theme of the entire council, or the purpose of the entire council, which was to to sort of have a, a moment of taking stock. How are we doing with uh, the Jesus's command in Matthew 28, go out and make disciples of all nations. You know, from my own perspective of uh, in catechetics, which is my area, I, um, I'm struck almost every document, uh, a catechetical document since the Second Vatican Council begins with Matthew 28. It, that's the starting point for evangelization, for catechesis, for the entire mission of the church. And so that reminder that even as we read this theological document with these themes, uh, that it really goes back to that essential command of Jesus that we are to be uh, his light um, in, in the world. So thank you for those excellent, really summary of, of all of those good themes with the idea that we are uh, looking at a church that as Pope Francis says, we move from maintenance to mission, always going to that, that sense that we're not just a self-enclosed reality, but one that is truly um, bringing the light of Christ into the world and the need to take on the perspective of balance uh, in all of these things, uh, not, you know, to the extreme. So thank you for those really helpful reminders. As, as we conclude, um, I wonder if you could just speak for a little bit about 
the connection between a theme that's very much at the forefront of the church's reflection uh, currently, which is synodality um, and Lumen Gentium. If you could just kind of connect those two for us uh, as we conclude our discussion. Thank you. Yes, this is a very, a very current topic, of course, and, and a, a word that's still a little bit unfamiliar. But we need to realize that even if the word is unfamiliar, the reality that it's it's conveying is something very, very deep and ancient in the heart of the church's life. So let's never think that this is just a new invention or some new kind of uh, craze of, <laughs> of the moment. It is a very deeply theological idea. And I, I, I think, if, if I may, I would just like to give a little bit of context for it, because one of the, the very remarkable things about the council is that the council adopts a template um, to, to really uh, talk about all of the different members of the church, because we're all baptized fundamentally into Christ, into the body of Christ. And the council uses that idea of that there are three officers of Christ, that Jesus is priest and prophet and king. And, you know, when we were saying before that the, the, the idea of the church as the pyramid tended to keep, you know, the, the people at the bottom of the pyramid in a very passive role, this idea of all the baptized sharing in the three officers of Christ is a massive way of energizing all the members of the church and especially all the faithful. Each and every baptized person has an active role to play, participating in these three offices of Christ. So, you know, sharing in the prophetic office means that everyone in the church is called to spread the good news, to bear witness to Christ. You know, not just the, the ministers of the church, not just the missionaries, every single person. We're all called to be prophetic in that sense, to share the good news, to, to give a good witness to our faith, if you like. We're also all called to live a priestly life. You know, yes, there are priests in the church, of course, and they make present the one sacrifice of Christ. But Vatican II says all of the faithful are called to join their own sacrifices to the one sacrifice of Christ, because the priestly people the deeply spiritual, a scriptural idea that, you know, we're meant to be offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Well, we might say that's exactly what we do in the Mass. We offer our spiritual sacrifices through him and with him and in him. That's the doxology in every Mass. So, yes, we need the ordained priests to make the sacrifice of Christ present in our midst, but then the priestly people unite their sacrifices to the one sacrifice of Christ. And by living as, you know, priestly people in the world, you might say, you know, it's still an idea which I think is very unfamiliar, and we really need to do a lot of work on this. But, you know, if you start the day with a morning offering, which is, you know, such a beautiful practice, what does that mean? I'm going to offer this day to God. This day is God's gift to me, and I want to fill it with good things that I can offer back to him. Well, offering gifts to God through the day means you're going to try and have a priestly day. That's precisely what the priesthood of the faithful is, offering our lives and our service and all that we're striving to do to God. And as I said before, Lumen Gentium says that if we live like that in the world, we will sanctify the world. And that's the great calling of all the faithful, as in their priestly office, if you like. And then in the kingly office, what's the kingly office? Well, you might say it's all the work that we do to spread the kingdom of God. And what's that kingdom? It's a kingdom of justice and love and peace. So when we just try and work for reconciliation and peace and goodness in the world, when we try and serve others and look after them, we are really exercising that kingly office of Christ. So, you know, to use this template for all of the faithful in the church and then to say that if you are ordained to a specific ministry in the church, then you receive a further participation in those same three officers with very specific responsibilities. But those three officers are like a template that the council and Lumen Gentium uses for all of the members of the church. And 
here's where we can, you know, focus in particular on synodality. Where is synodality rooted, if you like? Well, it's rooted in that prophetic office, the, the uh, you know, the witness that all of the faithful are called to give. Because Lumen Gentium, actually in number 12, says that, you know, all of the faithful, when they are baptized, are actually anointed by the Holy Spirit. And that anointing gives them a, a, a sense of the, the gifts of God. The sensus fide is, you know, a very rich idea that uh, Lumen Gentium mentions a couple of times in connection with this prophetic office, that all of the faithful are being anointed by the Spirit, they have a kind of instinct for the truth of God. And the whole church is has therefore, you know, a, a collective role to help to uh, discern the calling of the Holy Spirit at this point in history. How should we give our witness in the world? That, of course, is something that the Pope and the bishops have a special special responsibility to discern. But the point is, it's not their sole province, in other words, you know, not just them. The whole people of God is anointed with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you know, everybody has a contribution to make. Everybody is capable of insights into the mystery of God and the best way the church should witness today. So how are we making sure that we're listening to all of the faithful and, and not just, you know, leaving the, the great mass of the people of God just to be ultimately told what to do? No, they're meant to have some input as because precisely of, the, of their participation in that prophetic office, because all of the faithful are anointed with the Holy Spirit. Everyone, in other words, has a contribution to make. So how are we going to try and listen to everyone's voice? That is the whole great project of synodality. It's a bit mind boggling in many ways, you know. It's much easier just to say, oh, no, well, listen, everybody, just do what you're told. No, you know, if you're really going to embrace the biblical fact that all of the baptized are anointed with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to say that the Holy Spirit is still today guiding the church, that means that potentially each and every member of the faithful has an insight to offer, has something worthwhile to say. Now, of course, we need to have an orderly process for, for doing that listening. And there are going to be stages. It will start with all of the faithful being invited to, to contribute. And then the church's pastors, because they have a very special responsibility for discernment and ultimately the Pope himself. And, you know, in that address I mentioned of 2015, Pope Francis clearly spelt out, if you like, the operational stages of this process. But it must start by trying to listen to all of the people of God, giving everyone a chance to have their say. And that, of course, is the phase in, in the, the great sort of process of synodality that's currently underway. That's been the first phase of this process. And now it moves forward into further stages. And ultimately, the bishops or delegates of the bishops will gather in Rome with the Pope himself. And that will be the, the crowning of this long process that begins with listening to the people of God. And so this, as I say, it's, it's, in, it's, uh, it's a very, very ambitious project. And some people even look at the word synodality and say, well, this is a very peculiar word. I've never heard this before. But let us not think that this is some new idea that's just been that's just appeared out of nowhere. This is a deeply biblical, scriptural idea. And it, 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 the, 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 uh, the effort to listen to the faithful and to live a synodal life in the church goes back to the earliest centuries. And Pope Francis is really just, if you like, reviving that as part of the ongoing implementation of the council. Yes, it's, it's very unwieldy in a way, but it is the right thing to do because we are the people of God and everyone in the church has an active role to play in the life of the church. 
Thank you, Monsignor. That that is such a rich image of synodality. We tend to think of it just as simply as you know a series of conversations, or uh, but really this idea of listening, the church listening, is and that the way you've tied it to baptism, I think that's very powerful. That in a sense, it's our responsibility to participate in this, because by virtue of being anointed with the Holy Spirit, we have to bring bring those gifts and talents and uh, things to share with the church and listening. You know, I, I was thinking of the word listening itself. Um, it's the first word in the rule of St. Benedict. You know, he says, listen, my son, it's the whole spiritual life is rooted in listening. Uh, if we don't listen to God, uh, we, we don't grow in the spiritual life. So I think for the church to say, you know, we're going to listen to one another. That's a fundamental stance of a disciple. Um, and the church is now modeling and giving us this opportunity through the synodal process to to do that. So thank you for really reminding us of the deep sort of uh, baptismal roots of synodality, because only then we understand how important and how rich it is. So um, thank you once again, Monsignor McPartland. You've given us much to reflect on. I know our audience is grateful for these insights. So thank you for exploring with us the constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium. Uh, a document that is very much at the center of the courses you teach in the School of Theology and Religious Studies at the Catholic University of America. So once again, I'm very grateful for your time, and I look forward to continuing these reflections as we explore the remaining two constitutions of Vatican II. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. It's been uh, wonderful to have this conversation, and I, I look forward very much to the, the future conversations about the, the two remaining uh, constitutions. Thank you. I hope this conversation has furthered your understanding of the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. Be sure to join us as we continue reflecting on the Council's four constitutions. I'm Dr. Jem Sullivan. Thank you for joining this podcast. Keep the faith and keep echoing the faith.